Wow, God's been doing so much in our midst around here. I'm so thankful. I told Rita last night we came down here as we normally do on Saturday night and just walk through the room and pray a little and get everything set and be sure everything's ready. And I told her, I said, I don't even know if I can preach tomorrow. I'm just so messed up. The last two or three days, I've just been, I've just been sensing his spirit stirring. Part of my spirit is troubled because of the chaos on the earth. Part of my spirit was so sad yesterday as we remember 9-11, 20 years ago yesterday. Most of us can probably remember where we were 20 years ago yesterday when we heard the news about the first plane, Flight 11, striking one of the trade towers, and then a few minutes later, many of us had tuned in by then. 17 minutes later, Flight 175 hit the other tower. And I don't know what your thoughts were then or now, but those first two attacks were an attack on the economic condition of this country because the World Trade Towers represented economic influence, finance, wealth, increase around the world. So those two attacks, double attack on our finances. And then shortly after that, Flight 77 attacked and crashed into the Pentagon which represented an attack on the military strength of the United States of America because the Pentagon is the headquarters of our military. You ain't saying nothing. So now we are faced with an attack on the economy, a fat attack on our military, and then Flight 93 was headed to Washington, D.C., and... The speculation was that it would attack either the Capitol building or the White House, which was an attack on the head of this country. And the Islamic terrorist agenda and attack was to take out our economy take out our military and take out the leadership, the head of this nation. That was the intent. 20 years ago yesterday, that was a wake-up call. Veronica, could you put that other slide up for just a moment? If it won't mess you up. So, most of you know the story and you might have read the transcript that I posted yesterday on social media the transcript between Todd Beamer and a 911 operator and he made the phone call and said our plane has been hijacked she confirmed that the trade centers had been attacked, probably confirmed later in the conversation that the Pentagon had been attacked. And they discerned they were heading towards Washington. And so Todd Beamer got together with some others on the plane and they attacked the terrorist. The terrorist had already executed one passenger in first class, had already stabbed to death several of the stewardesses up front in first class. They had already taken over the cabin and were piloting the plane. And Todd Beamer made his famous, now famous statement to those that had partnered with him 
let's roll. And they rolled. They rolled up the aisle, took out the terrorist, somehow got into the cockpit and were able to thwart the attack on the head. Is that the best you can do? I mean, is that the best you can do? We have freedom. You can be seated. Here's what a lot of you may not know. That plane went down in a field just outside Shanksville, Pennsylvania. How many remember that? That may not mean a lot to you, but I believe it symbolizes the hand of the Lord. Because Shanksville may not be significant to you, but in Jewish culture, in Jewish history, when they killed the lamb and they partook of the meat, the best part was the shank of the lamb. And I believe the Lord was just saying of all the places the plane could have gone down, I stepped in and stopped this and it did not attack your head. It did not take out the Capitol or the White House or leadership there in Washington, D.C. But I just put the nose down here at the shank of the lamb. Shanksville. And we've had 20 years to never forget. And look what a mess we're in. Look what a mess we're in. So what are we going to do? It's great to hoop at ball games. It's, it's great to say we will never forget. But folks, say that again. Could we get some folks that would like to roll? Are there any patriots in the house that love this country and love our God and we're thankful for the freedoms that we have and we would make the statement, the proclamation, the declaration that no matter what, let's roll. We're not gonna have our freedoms taken away from us. We're not gonna have our rights taken away from us, but we will fight, we will stand, we will be the church. Come on somebody, let's roll. You know, they're trying to divide us and it doesn't really matter what your opinion is on whether you ought to wear a mask or not wear a mask or have a vaccination or not, wear, uh, not have a vaccination. That's not the point. The point is we ought to be able to decide. You should be able to decide. You should be able to make a decision and a choice for your life, for your body, for your family. Come on, somebody. I hear the roar of the lion of the tribe of Judah. Look at somebody and give them a high five and shout out, let's roll. Father, we pray right now for all the families across this nation. Those that were in New York City and their family members that were there and spread across this nation and even around the world. We pray for them now on this 20th anniversary 
on the morning after. We pray for them. We pray for this nation. We come against every spirit of tyranny. We come against every judgmental spirit. We come against every spirit of antichrist. We come against every spirit of division and divorce that would separate us as people of God, that would separate us as patriots. We come against that spirit. We break the assignment. We stand on your word. We stand on 2 Chronicles 714 in the name of Jesus where you told us if my people which are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways then I will hear from heaven I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land father we humble ourselves today we repent of our sins as a nation we repent of our sins and we call on you and we ask you in the name of Jesus to hear our prayer to hear our cry and to heal our land in the name of Jesus, give us some time. Pour out your spirit. Send revival. Give us a great latter day outpouring. In the name of Jesus, let us see your glory. Let us feel your power. Let us experience your anointing and use us to make a difference in a lost and dying world. And we give you the praise and all of the glory in the mighty name, the name above every name, the Lion of Judah, Jesus, we pray. Amen, amen, and amen. Come on, put your hands together and bless him today. Can I borrow your charger? Hmm. How many knows what that means? Can I borrow your charger? Anybody have one with you that I could borrow? Let me see your hand. Anybody, you got one with you? One, two. I don't mean in the car, I mean in the room. How many of you got one with you? One, there's one back there, there's one here. Two, three. Three. Four. You can just about pick out the personalities that have their charger with you. They are prepared folk. The Bible calls them wise folk. The rest of us. Oh, no, I can't, I can't say us. The rest of y'all. Because I have, I have my charger. Where are we, folks? Where are we? Where are we? What's happening? I thought somebody would say, we're in a war, but I didn't hear it. I've been saying it for months, about 18 months, but nobody said it. Where are we? Yeah, let's do that, men. One, two, three. That was pretty good. I give you 80. Let's do it again. One, two, three. Ruah! 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 And for those of you that think that's just a military thing, you didn't read Genesis 2 7. You didn't read where God breathed in the man the breath of life. The word breathe there is ruah, breath of God, spirit of God. So where are we? Don't be afraid to say it. Where are we? We are in a war. Some folks are just floating through life. Just wish things would get back to normal. When the things go, I can't wait till everything gets back to normal. It'll be better then. It'll be so nice. When I can go back to my restaurant and my job and I have to wear a mask, not have to do this, not have to worry about all the pressure. I just don't like all the pressure. I don't like all the division. I don't like all the fussing and confusion. Just, I just wanted to go back to normal. Folks, we are in a war. We are in a battle. The battle is raging. 
it is raging around us. And here's the thing. We war not against flesh and blood. Our battle is not against flesh and blood. It's not against each other. You're not in battle in war against folks in this room. You're not even in battle against folks in different thought patterns or different skin colors or different nations or anything like that. We are in a spiritual battle, a spiritual war with demons, with principalities, with powers, with spiritual wickedness in heavenly places. Oh, somebody quit me right then. Somebody's all saying, oh, he's going to talk about that. There ain't no such thing as demons. Who would, who would think that? Who would say that? Really? Really? So I ain't never seen no demon. I, I just don't think there's no demons. I mean, I never seen an angel. You ever seen an angel? I ain't seen an angel. I had not seen a demon. No, what's he talking about? Yeah. Let me just break it down. There is a spiritual realm that most of us are not privy to step into or to see very often. Most of us. The last few years of my granddad's life, he reportedly saw an angel or angels at least twice a week. But now he would pray three and four hours a day. And he never took any medicine a day of his life. Never. Not even an aspirin. Not even cough syrup. He was healed of many things many times. God used him to raise three people from the dead. So he wasn't like the average American Joe. But there's a spiritual realm and we're in a war and the battle is raging and we need to wake up. Look at your neighbor and say, can I borrow your charger? Now, depending on whether you are a wise or foolish person, you need to look back in them and say one of a couple things. No, go get your own. Or I don't have one. I was hoping I could borrow yours. Y'all ready to go to work? Here we go. Life is full of gauges, warning signs. How many have ever run out of gas? Be honest now. Hold them up. Raise your hand up. If you've ever, I, I mean, not, not last week, last week, last month, last year, but I mean, if you've ever in your life run out of gas, how many of you run out, keep your hands up, how many of you, you were in a car and somebody else ran out of gas and it wasn't your fault, but you ran out. Come on, hold them up just a minute. All right, put them down. How many of you have never been in a car and never run out of gas? Those are the ones I want to see. Few. Few. I ran out of gas one time. Notice I said one time. And I vowed I will never run out of gas again. It's a fool that runs out of gas. So, yeah, but if you're living on paycheck to paycheck and you only got $3 in your pocket and you pull up and put a dollar in, I, I understand that. I get me a bicycle so I can pedal. I'm not going to run out of gas again. I ran out of gas in 19... 1982. Because I rolled into the parking lot of the church I was pastoring at that time and I had just gone there. And I was in an ugly green Buick diesel. I remember. And I said, fool. Talking to myself, fool. You will never do this again. And I have never done that again. And I used to have a rule that I would never let it get below a quarter of a tank left. Then I moved it up to a half a tank. And now... When it gets to three quarters full and one quarter gone, I am looking for a place to fill up. And unless they're out of gas and we can't get any, none of us, I won't be running out. As a matter of fact, I have some at home in my garage just waiting. And so when you spend all of yours, I've got diesel and gasoline. 
I hope y'all ain't in a hurry today. How many of you do not have any type of cell phone or device that you carry? Let me see your hand. How many of you do not? One? Just one? Anybody else? Because I knew if I, raised, if I said everybody, all y'all wouldn't raise your hand. It wouldn't get everybody. So we pretty well got it covered that most everybody has a phone or a device, right? Right? And when you start running out of fuel on the on the phone when the when the when the battery charge gets low how many have seen this little sign up here low battery <laughs> every day so here's the thing life life has gauges life has warning signs we have uh, signals around us so that when we we know we know when the power is getting low. We know. If you hadn't paid your electric bill at home, you know. If you don't pay it, they might give you a little grace period, but if you don't pay it, guess what? They're going to cut off your power. They're going to cut off your water. If you don't put fuel in your car, it's not going to run on fumes very long. Now, you might be a lot more spiritual than some of us, and you might get further down the road because you're praying over it. But by and large, when there's no gas, it's going to quit. When there's no battery life left on the phone, it's going to quit. And that's when some of y'all start looking around saying, can I borrow your charger? You'd think you'd have your own charger. But no, can, can I borrow your charger? And some of y'all are thinking, what? in the world does this have to do with God or the Bible? I'm glad you asked. Matthew 25. Here we go. At that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like 10 virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five of them were wise. Look at your neighbor and say, which one are you? Five of them were foolish and five of them were wise. The foolish ones took their lamps. They had their lamps. They had their phone. They had, they had their car. Five of them, the foolish ones, they took their lamps, but they did not take any oil with them. And we'll see in a moment that the lamps were working. They had oil in the lamp. They just didn't have enough. Somebody shout, not enough. So the foolish ones took their lamps, but they did not take any oil with them. Let me translate. They didn't have the charger. Well, they had their device. They had, they had the lamp. They had the light. How long will your battery hold out when you turn the light on and just let it run and you're doing all the other apps and everything else you're doing, talking on the phone and playing music and got your earbuds in and everything and your light's going. How long will your phone last? How long will, will the charge stay in? Depends on the age of your phone, some folk. Because they've sabotaged us. The phone makers, they, they download these, what do they call them? These updates. They download these updates to you. And if you're not real careful, when you download, download the, the last one, the wrong one, the one that's designed to zap the energy on your battery, you'll go from having battery all day one day, and the next day it quits by 11 o'clock in the morning or 10 or 9.30. How many have experienced that? And they've admitted it. It's true. That's true. They've admitted that. They sabotage you. Let me tell you, there is a thief we read about in John 10. 
His name is Lucifer, and he will do everything he can to sabotage you. He will do every. He doesn't care if you have your Bible under your arm and it's a family Bible. He doesn't care if you stand on the street corner with a megaphone shouting out, Jesus loves you, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. He doesn't care about all of those things that you do. He just wants to sabotage your life. He wants to sabotage your journey. He wants to suck the spiritual life out of you so that you are depleted and empty and your light will not shine and you can't get anybody else to heaven, not even yourself. That's what he wants to do. Verse four, the wise ones, however, look at your neighbor and say, that's me. Oh, come on, tell them like you mean it. That's me. The wise ones, however, they had their lamps, but they also, also took oil in jars along with the lamps. They were wise ones. Let me read it again. The wise ones, however, took oil in jars along with their lamps. They were prepared. They had what they needed. The bridegroom was a long time in coming. And so they all became drowsy and fell asleep. Whew, there's a lot of preaching here. There are a lot of folks today that because he has delayed his return, the church has become drowsy, asleep, just continuing as things were, talking about, well, when things get back to normal. Oh, I'm so sleepy. I'm so tired. The bridegroom was a long time in coming, and they all became drowsy. All of them, all 10, the wise ones too. And they fell asleep. But at midnight, the cry rang out. Here's the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all the virgins woke up. Well, I could stop right there and preach a while. Woke. Then all the virgins woke up and trimmed their lamps. You better wake up. I said, you better wake up. You better wake up to what's going on. You better wake up to what's happening in this country and what's happening on planet Earth. How was it that it was said, it doesn't matter, I, I probably can't get the quote right, but the way evil increases and flourishes is that good people, good men just do nothing. Something to that, something to that effect. Then all the virgins woke up and they trimmed their lamps. That means that the lamps were there. They were lit, but they weren't shining bright. And when it was time to get up, to wake up, they trimmed them. They turned them up. They brightened them. They held the torch high so the light would shine, so the bridegroom would see them because they were supposed to be ready, prepared, and waiting for him to come. Verse 8, the foolish ones said to the wise, can I borrow your charger? I've got my device, I've got my light, but my battery is going dead. The foolish ones said to the wise, give us some of your oil. There's a conflict here. Because in one place, the Bible says, if your neighbor comes to you and asks you for a coat, give him your cloak also. If he asks you to go a mile with him, go two miles. So there's a conflict. There's apparent conflict. Because, you know, if, if one of the brides who's waiting with the 10 comes to you 
and says, give me some of your oil. Our, our, our spiritual man says, okay, yeah. But not in this case. This is what the Bible says. Give us some of your oil. Watch this now. Our lamps are going out. Which means they were lit. Which means there was some oil in the lamp. Because it couldn't go out if it wasn't lit, right? But they said, give us some of your oil. Our lamps are going out. I love this. Verse 9. What, is, what does the number 9 mean? Birthing. See, you have to read the Bible. You can't just read the Bible. You have to know what the Bible says. You have to know what God means and how he puts little messages everywhere. And it's not an accident that this is verse 9. No, they replied. They were birthing a new response that was dictated by the situation. Oh, you didn't hear me. Normally they would say, yeah, I'll give you some oil. Do you need my lamp also? Do we need to go together to the store? Do I need to loan you some money to go buy some? But in verse nine, it says, no, they replied. There may not be enough for both of us. Instead, here's a, here's a solution. Go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourselves. Can I borrow your charger? Can I use your phone? Can I borrow your charger? Can you give me some oil to go in my lamp because mine's going out? No, no, there may not be enough for both us and you. Instead, go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourselves. Advance, please, Veronica. Mine has quit working. But while they were on their way to buy the oil, the bridegroom arrived. While they were on their way, while they were out of pocket, while they were distracted, while they were going to do the good thing, they, they wanted to get oil so they could trim their lamps, but they had not been prepared. They thought they had plenty of time. They thought that when the bridegroom came, they would still be able to go and get some and get back. They thought they could make it. They were not managing their time. They were not good time managers. They were not prepared. They, were, they had not done the, the proper preparation in advance because we don't know when he's coming back for us. We don't know when the bridegroom is coming. We don't know when the rapture will take place. We don't know when Jesus Christ is going to step out into nothing in midair and the trumpet's going to sound and the dead in Christ shall rise first and we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together to meet the Lord in the clouds. We don't know when that's going to be so we can't just go out and do a little clubbing this weekend and say well the Lord understands we can't go out and say I just I've got so many problems I'm just going to go get drunk I'm just going to go get food drunk I think that will help me even though it won't and you know that it won't I'm just going to go out and I'm just going to have some adulterous relationships and some fornication I'm just going to do some of those things nobody will know wife's out of town who would know I always had trouble, you know, just going to Walmart and stealing stuff that I, I could afford to buy. But I just like the thrill of the steal. Do I need to go through the Ten Commandments with you as a refresher course? Exodus chapter 20, thou shalt not. I, I come back for page two. I'll do that later. While they were on their way to buy the oil, the bridegroom arrived. The virgins who were ready, the virgins who were ready, the ones who were ready, the ones who were prepared, the ones who were wise, the ones who did not get caught off guard, the ones that brought some extra oil with them, the ones that were ready, went in with the bridegroom to the wedding banquet 
and the door was shut. Yes, he's a God of grace. Yes, he's a loving God. Yes, he died on the cross so all of us, whosoever would believe, could have everlasting life. Yes, he did. But he also gives us some instruction that we must adhere to until he comes. And if you don't believe, the door will be shut I don't know how many times I've gone to funerals and preachers preached somebody into heaven when everybody knew they lived like the devil. So, Pastor, that's mean. But it's the truth. Everybody that dies does not go to heaven. There are some folks that live like the devil and act like the devil. They never repented of their sins, not even on their deathbed, and so they don't make it to heaven. I'm sorry. I'm not a universalist. Universalist doctrine says everybody's going to be saved. God's a loving, merciful God. He wouldn't send anybody to hell. Everybody's going to be saved. No, the Bible says straight is the way and narrow is the gate that leads to heaven, to eternal life, and few there be that find it. I'm sorry if I'm stepping on your toe or messing up your theology. The virgins who were ready went in with him. You've got to be ready when the Lord comes back. You've got to be ready when your heart stops beating. You've got to be ready when the life leaves your body. You must be ready. And those that were ready went in with him to the wedding banquet and the door was shut. He will shut the door. Later, somebody say later. Later, Later, the others also came. Lord, Lord, they said, open the door for us. But he replied, truly, I tell you, I don't know you. I don't know you. What's he saying? Is he saying he doesn't know their name? He doesn't know who they are? He doesn't know from when they were born from the foundation of the earth? Because he says, see, there's another apparent conflict. The Bible says from the foundation of the earth, in your mother's womb, he knew you. That's what it says. But now he said, I don't know you. So what's he saying? What is the translation? He's saying there's no relationship between me and you. You had every opportunity to be prepared. You've heard the gospel preached. You know what's right. You know what you're supposed to do. You have a devil conquering destiny, but I can't help that you made the wrong choice and you went down the wrong road and you did the wrong thing and you just kept on going and everything I did to try to stop you, to get you back on track, you just kept following the bling bling. You kept following the sin. You kept going in the wrong direction. You kept ignoring my call, ignoring your prayer, the prayers of your family members. You just kept doing your own thing justifying your sin thinking you would be okay and you had plenty of time but he replied truly I tell you I don't know you therefore keep watch stay awake keep watch because you do not know the day or the hour. Next slide. The ten virgins represent two groups of people. Two groups in the church. Two groups in the world. Really in in the church. Two groups. First group is the possessors. The possessors. These are the real Christians who possess the oil of the Holy Spirit, the power of God. They're serving God. They love Jesus. We're all human. They may make mistakes. They may stumble or struggle or fall, but they get up and repent and apologize to God and fix it with somebody else. If they messed up with somebody else, they are the real possessors. These are the people. These are the true believers of God that are in the church, God's church on planet earth. Red, yellow, brown, black, and white, rich and poor, young and old, all over the world. These are the people of God. Somebody shout, the possessors. They possess 
the Spirit of God and the oil of the Holy Spirit in them. Romans 8, 9. But you are not controlled by your sinful nature. We're talking about possessors now. You are not controlled by your sinful nature. We all have a sinful nature. We all are tempted. But you are not controlled by your sinful nature. You are controlled, you true possessors. You are controlled by the Spirit. If you have the Spirit of the living God or the God living in you. And remember that those who do not have the Spirit of Christ living in them do not belong to him at all. Let me read it again. Romans 8, 9. But you are not controlled by your sinful nature. You are controlled by the Spirit. If you have the Spirit of God living in you and you remember, and remember that those who do not have the Spirit of Christ living in them do not belong to him at all. It's a simple test. If God's living in you and you possess his spirit and you possess his oil, you are going to live for him. You are going to live right, act right, talk right, help others. You're supposed to do what the Bible tells us. And if you really possess God in your heart, you will. You're not controlled by your sinful nature. You are controlled by the spirit. Those that do not have the spirit of Christ living in them do not belong to him at all. Even though they might have Christian plastered across their forehead, even they might have a hat on that says, I am a child of God. Even though they wear, wear church clothes and go to church on Sunday and they have bumper stickers on their car that say, I belong to such and such a church. Even though they might play music instruments and they might sing in the choir, they might even stand in the sacred pulpit behind this sacred desk and preach on Sunday. But if they don't have the spirit of God living in them, this verse plainly says they do not belong to him at all. Could I tell you there are imposters in the church that are not true possessors? Could I tell you there are hypocrites and liars and thieves and there are deceptions and imposters in the church? They are all over the church on planet earth. Did you not read about the wheats and the tares, about the goats and the sheep? Next slide. Ten virgins represent two groups. The true possessors and the professors. Professors merely claim to know Christ. They're the claimers. Can I borrow your, your charger? I actually have cords I've got a longer cord and a shorter cord chargers come with all different lengths of cords you can get them three feet long six feet long 12 feet 20 feet you can buy extension cords connectors so pastor you only got one charger yep but it's a dual plug I can plug both of them in Professors merely claim to know Christ. They'll tell you, oh yeah, I'm a Christian. Can't you tell I go to church every Sunday? Can't you tell I got my Bible on my coffee table? Can't you tell I speak Christianese with a perfect accent, brother? I'm good at Christianese. But professors, they only claim to know Christ. They don't really know him. How you know, pastor, you're being awful judgmental. Did you read Titus 1.16? Such people claim they know God. It's in the Bible now. I'm not making this up. It's in the Bible. Such people claim they know God, but they deny him. They deny him, not with their mouth, not with their words. They say, oh, I'm a Christian. I'm an American. I'm a Christian. You're not born into it. You can be born into Islam, 
and you're an Islamist. You can be born into Hinduism. You can be born into many other world religions. You might be born into a Christian family. You might be born in a Christian nation. But the only way to become a Christian is to confess your sins to him in a personal one-on-one relationship. You don't get it by osmosis. You don't get it by being in the family or being in the nation. Titus 1.16, such people claim they know him, but they deny him by the way they live. And we see folks that live like the devil and they say, oh yeah, I got saved when I was nine. I was baptized at 12. Yeah. Such people claim they know God, but they deny him by the way they live. If they're not living for him, here is the plain, mean, hard truth. They don't know him. And the Bible in Titus 1.16 says this about them. They are detestable and disobedient. Here's a good word. They are worthless for doing anything good. Detestable, disobedient, and worthless. Hmm. Reading on in 2 Timothy 3, you can read the whole chapter. You need to read what it says. But just part of verse 5 says, they will act religious. <laughs> they will act religious. I hate religion. I despise the spirit of religion. The spirit of religion, it enslaves entire people groups. It, it, it teaches that if you dress a certain way, if your hair's a certain length, if you have on a certain kind of skirt or a certain kind of shirt or you, you wear a certain kind of suit, that if you do all of those things, you look religious, then you must be saved. But 2 Timothy says these kind of people, they will act religious, but they will reject the power that could make them godly. Stay away. From people like that. Possessors or professors? Which are you? Do you possess the real Spirit of God, His oil, the power of the Holy Spirit? Or do you just play the part? You'd get an Academy Award for playing the part because you're such a good actor. Look at your neighbor and say, Can I borrow your charger? Next slide, Veronica. This parable that we've just read is about being ready for Jesus to come back. That's what it's about. Many people belong to a church and they profess to know him, but they're not born again. They just profess, they claim. When he returns... They will be shut out. The door will be shut. They'll be separated from God. They'll be separated from family and friends who knew Christ and made it in. And it will be a time of bitter remorse. We are in the preparation season. We are in desensitization. We are in preconditioning. The world is in chaos. The Bible says in the last days when the Antichrist comes on the scene, he will bring, listen carefully, it says the Antichrist will bring world peace. How can he bring world peace if everything's already peaceful? And you think things are going back to normal. Now what's going to happen is it's going to be so chaotic the war that we are in is going to explode across the globe and there will be world chaos. And the mark of the beast, the Bible says it is the number 666. And if you don't take the mark, they say you won't be able to buy or sell. You can have money, but you can't buy if you don't take the mark. But the Bible also says if you take the mark, you're doomed for hell. You won't make it to heaven. So there's a dilemma. If we're here at any time during that season, during the tribulation period, the only way you can eat or buy and sell 
is to take the mark. But if you take the mark, you're doomed. And so don't tell me that preconditioning is not taking place now. You, you've come too late to try to deceive me. You've come too late to tell me that there is not preconditioning going on and desensitization going on and, and a conditioning process, getting people ready to give in. Come on. It's in the book. We have to wake up. And I told Rita the other day, I think I told you this a week or so ago. Nobody's going to announce. No government agency is going to announce. Nobody's going to say, come get the mark of the beast over here. You can come to this agency at this time and get the mark of the beast. Come get your chip. Come get your mark on your right hand or your forehead. This is it. Come and get it now. They're not going to do that. They're not. People will be deceived. At his return, they will shut out, be shut out from his presence. The door will be shut. We have to have our charger. And I'm not talking about your device, your iPhone, your Android, your computer, your iPad, or any other device. I'm talking about your spirit man. Don't be deceived. I'm talking about your spirit, man. I'm not trying to be cute. I'm trying to get the point across. Because all of us have said at one time or another, can I borrow your charger? Next slide. Many in the church look useful to the kingdom. But they're not part of his kingdom because they really have no oil and they have no light. They're imposters. They may look useful. That's why. You say, well, how do we know, Pastor? I'm glad you asked. We have to pray that God will give us discernment. We must have discernment. Next slide. So here it is, Matthew 25, 10. The virgins who were ready went in, and the door was shut. The virgins who were ready, the ones that were prepared, the true possessors, the one that had the Spirit of God, because this is a parable teaching us about when the Lord comes back. The virgins who were ready went in with him, with Jesus, to the wedding banquet and the door was shut. So we have to be ready. We have to stand. We have to hear the roar. So when somebody says, can I borrow your charger? Here's what you say. No, not this time. You need your own charger. You need your own relationship with Jesus. You can't ride in on my coattail. You can't get there on my prayers. Don't be mean or ugly. Just say no. Can I pray with you right now? We got to be ready. I wonder how many of you would say, Pastor, I'm ready. If the Lord came right now, today, this moment, if I, if I dropped dead with a heart attack, if I were to get killed in a car wreck this afternoon without one more prayer, without one more church service, without paying any tithes, without having to give an offering, without doing anything, I know that I know that I know I'm ready right now, this moment, if the Lord came back from me, I'm ready. Wave at me as a testimony. Hallelujah. How many of you would say, Pastor, I want to be ready. I plan to be ready. I've been ready. I, but right now, this moment, I'm not sure that if I died right now, if the Lord came back right now, if I got killed in a car wreck this afternoon, I, I'm just not sure 100% I would hope that I would go. I, I would hope I would have time to pray. But I'm, I'm just not sure that if I died right now, I'm not sure I would go to heaven. And I don't want to go to hell. And I want to go to heaven pray for me. If that's you, just wave at me. Just put your hand up. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Thank you. Anybody else? You would say, Pastor, I plan to go. I want to go. Don't want to go to hell. I'm just not sure I'm ready right now. Wave at me. Anybody else? I'm talking to somebody. Come on. Wave at me. Be bold. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? You got to be ready. 
You can't borrow somebody else's charger. You can't go on somebody else's prayer. You can't, you won't have time to go to the oil, go to the store and buy oil. When the Lord comes, the Bible says he's going to split the eastern sky. It's going to happen. The Bible says it like this. In a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, the last trumpet will sound. The dead in Christ shall rise first, and then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air. It's going to happen that fast. Revelation 3.10 says he will keep us from the hour of temptation that will come upon the whole world to try and test the whole world. Revelation 3.10. People that know about the rapture and the tribulation, there's, there's three different doctrines or theologies about the tribulation. There are people that are pre-trib. They believe the church is going to be raptured before the tribulation or maybe at the very first part. And I'm one of those. And I use Revelation 3.10. That's the doctrine that pre-trib folks use. And the Lord, he says, I will keep you from the hour of temptation that comes upon the world. In Revelation chapter 1, 2, and 3, we read about the church, the churches of Asia Minor. And then after Revelation 3.10, the church is not mentioned at all until the very last part of the, of, uh, the book of Revelation. So it appears that the church was raptured out or taken out. But there's some others that believe a different theology. They believe that the church will go through part of the tribulation, the first three and a half years, and they call themselves mid-trib. And they believe that halfway through the tribulation, because the first three and a half years of the tribulation, by and large, are going to be peaceful. The Antichrist comes on the scene. He brings peace to the world. The chaos calms down. There'll be a one world government, a one world currency. You know, they're talking about crashing the dollar. I've been telling you for several years, the dollar's going to collapse. It's biblical. This is all in the Bible. You can read it. It's biblical prophecy. It's in the book. Read Daniel and Revelation. Study it. But I'll warn you, some of it's very alarming, but it's going to happen. Do you see what's happening on planet Earth today? And so the mid-tribbers, they'll believe that they're going to be raptured about midway through the tribulation because about halfway through the tribulation is when the Antichrist turns bad. He's going to bring peace. and Everybody's going to think he is the Messiah, the long-awaited Messiah. Even the Jews are going to be deceived. They've been looking for him for 2,000 years, waiting on him. They did not accept Jesus as the Messiah. And when the Antichrist comes, they're going to think, well, this is the Messiah. We've been waiting for him. He's caused fire from heaven. He does miracles. He does all these things. He must be the Messiah. He brought world peace. He's got a world government. He's got world currency. And everybody on the whole planet is at peace. And oh, isn't this wonderful? But then about halfway through the tribulation, the Antichrist makes an image of himself and puts it in the temple to be worshipped. And the Jews remember Exodus 20. Thou shalt have no other gods before me and thou shalt not worship any graven image. And they wake up and they realize they've been deceived. And they realize that this is the Antichrist. They wake up. And when that happens, the Bible says at least 12,000 from all 12 tribes of Israel will be saved. 144,000 will be saved at least. And others will be saved on the planet. But then at, at that point, at the halfway point, all hell breaks out. In the last three and a half years, you don't want to be here. Let me just tell you, you don't want to be here. And during that time, there's going to be war. There's going to be chaos. And, and here, the Bible also says that the spirit of death will be taken out. People will try to commit suicide, but they won't die. They'll have their injury, but death will leave. And so they will maim themselves. They'll cut themselves. They'll shoot themselves. They'll stab themselves. They'll try to die. They'll try to kill. They'll pray for the mountain to fall on them, but they cannot die. My God, they cannot die. And you think you can make it through the tribulation? If you can't make it now, you won't make it then. You will die and you will go to hell. And it started. It has started. Wake up, wake up, wake up. It has started. 
what can I do to tell you it has started? We've got to wake up. I don't know what I can do. I don't know what else I can say. But there's a lot more I'm going to say. Not today, but it's coming. Just get ready. As long as I've got a voice, I'm going to cry out, I need your prayers. Read it, I need your prayers. This leadership needs your prayers. But in the meantime, we've got to get ready. Are you ready? Should he come today? Are you ready? Anybody else should say, Pastor, I plan to go to heaven, but I'm not sure I'm ready right now. Pray for me. If that's you, wave at me. Anybody else? We're going to pray. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Anybody else? Here's what we're going to do as we close. I want you to get your offering and your tithe ready, your gift. We're going to worship the Lord with our offerings and our gifts. You can give cash. You can write a check. You can use the number on the screen, 423-200-4470. You can text give to that number. You can use the website, the app. You can use one of the envelopes in the seat pocket in front of you. But I want to pray for you before we go. Because we're in a war. We're in a war. And I want, I want to pray for you. I want to cover you. I want you to know that you're covered. I've been privileged to do crusades around the world in a number of countries. Some of you went with us to Honduras and we had thousands that were there. We were part of a one nation, one day where 2,000 plus missionaries went into Honduras and blitzed the nation, all 18 states. And we had the state of Cologne. And over 1.3 million people were saved in one day during those meetings that week. And I was reminded this morning how when we go and do those crusades, I like to go to the, to the place where they're going to be held. And those of you that went to Honduras or some of you went to Africa with us, I like to go to the, to the stadium or to the field or whatever it is and go before, beforehand before the people arrive. And I like to walk the perimeter praying with the team. And we'll walk the whole area. We'll walk the bleachers or we'll walk the field and we'll pray and ask God to pour out his spirit and to save the lost and to heal the sick. And he does. He does. Obviously, when they're tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of people you can't lay hands on everybody but what happens is you just pray and tens of thousands are healed demons are cast out lives are transformed through the power of the Holy Spirit so as we pray we pray toward these cameras and ask God to, to do that wherever they are around the world. Are you ready to worship and give? Are you ready to pray? I know it's late. And we, we intend to get you out sooner than I, than I have. But I really feel like today's message is crucial as a wake-up call for where we're headed. So we've, we've got to be ready. Would you stand? And I want everybody to come down.
just stand in these altars, get as close as you can, bring your offering, your gifts, your tithe, the containers are down here. If you can't get to those, you can put them on the steps or on the side there, just, just bring them in and get as close as you can. And if you lifted your hand, please come, I wanna pray. We're gonna pray with everybody. But if you lifted your hand, please come down and join us. Everybody come. Everybody come. We're going to pray. We're going to be dismissed. Do you feel his presence? Do you hear the roar? Do you sense the anointing? Put your hand on your heart and lift your other hand to him and pray this prayer with me. Jesus, I recognize you as the son of the living God. And I thank you for loving me, for dying for me on the cross. And today, I make a public confession that I am a sinner and I repent of all my sins. I invite you into my heart. Fresh and new today. To be the Lord of my life. I want to please you. I want to walk in my destiny. I want to be used by you. And I want to go to heaven. When my time comes. I'm trusting you. To help me. And to use me. Bless me, today. Bless me today. Fill me with your spirit. Me with your spirit. Baptize, me Baptize me with your Holy Spirit. Your Holy spirit. I, want I want all you have. I don't want to play church. I, play church. I, don't want to be I don't want to be religious. I don't want to go through the motions. I, want to go the I want to be a true possessor, a true possessor. Of, your of your spirit, full and overflowing full and of, your power. of your power. I want to see miracles in my life and in my world. Use me. Teach me. Guide me in the name of Jesus. And I will do my best. If I stumble and fall, I will not quit. I will get up. I will repent. I will go forward. And I will trust you to help me every step of the way. Thank you, Jesus, Thank you, Jesus, for all you've done, for, all you've for loving me. For loving Thank you for giving me insight, Thank you for giving me insight and, revelation and revelation into your word, into your word so, I so I can be prepared and I can help others can help that, are that are not prepared. I will teach them. I will lead by example as you help me day by day. In the name of Jesus. I pray and I believe. Amen, amen, and amen. Hallelujah. Just tell him you love him and praise him right now. Lift your hand or give him a hand clap offering. Just take a moment and thank him and praise him. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, mighty God. We praise you, mighty God. We thank you for the miracles. We thank you for healing. We thank you for deliverance. We thank you for victory. We thank you for showing us your glory. We thank you for waking us up, oh God.